Nathan East, and today we're going to go over fundamentals in bass playing. Glad to have you with us with your basses, and uh, first of all, we'd like to tune up. First, we'll start with the G string. D string, second. Next, the A string. Tuning, very important. And the E string. And for those of you with five string basses, the B string. It's the low B string. Okay, the bass guitar, my personal favorite instrument of all times. Uh, one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life was to uh, learn how to play it. And uh, as a result of that, I've been able to travel all around the world playing for different people and having a great time, as I'm sure you will. And we'll go over a few things right now uh, involving technique. Uh, we'll speak about right hand technique, left hand deck technique, the uh, thumb versus playing with the two finger technique. And uh, we'd like to take a look at the two finger technique. This is um, something that I usually use and there are a lot of exercises that I used to um, play to help me develop the two finger technique. It's the two fingers, the first finger and the second finger. And to do trills that um, eventually can have speeds. What I used to do is practice very slowly, and we can take a look at um, a closer look at this exercise. Starting out very slowly, alternating fingers, noticing the difference between the sound when you play it soft or play it hard or use your nails. Now keep it as even as possible and gradually speed up. It's always a good idea to practice with a metronome. Get that solid click going and eventually speed it up. Notice the tone difference. Closer to the bridge, tighter. Closer to the neck. Okay, so, so far so good. That's basically pretty easy. And uh, fingers are very important in uh, tone placement. Uh, Wherever you put your fingers, that's going to have a lot to do with the tone of the note. And this is a very important um, thing depart depending on what music you're playing. So for instance, if you want a fatter tone, you would play closer to the neck of the bass and it would sound bigger. Now as you get closer to the bridge, the tone gets thinner and more percussive. 
so you can hear it changes. So if you were playing jazz, for instance, a walking bass line. You would play closer to the neck. And then if you were playing a more percussive kind of a sound, you'd play closer to the bridge. Then there's an yet another dimension to the tone that you can get. And that's by using a little bit of your fingernail as, as a pick. So there's the sound of your, just your finger, but then there's the sound of your fingernail. And uh, we use this on records often uh, where we want the bass to sound sort of like a guitar where it can be. gives you sort of a pick effect with your fingers. Now there's a cross string groove that we can do that it's sort of like target practice where you're playing and jumping a string, playing the octaves for instance. And what that does is just helps your accuracy and we can take a closer look at that. It's always good to start slowly and increase your speed. Now that was fun, wasn't it? And uh, another exercise that you can practice that would uh, make use of that is... Okay, next we'd like to work on the left hand technique. Now that you have the right hand pretty well worked out, there are a few exercises that are just good to do and we'll do some together. It's like calisthenics when you wake up in the morning. These are some of the first exercises that I learned and I find them very helpful in getting the left and right hand coordination together. First of all, we would start at the first fret and since I have a five string, we'll start on the B string with the note C. And what we're going to do is alternate fingerings. We're going to go across the neck of the bass, starting with the first two fingers. And then the first and third fingers. And then fingers one and four. Then we'll change to fingers two and three. And two and four. And then fingers three and four, which are the most difficult, as you will find out. So the exercise sounds like this, and we should all do it together at first slowly and increase the speed. Stretch those fingers out. Okay, Jane Fonda would be proud of you. Now we're going to do a little faster. Those fingers three and four really start to get a workout after a while. And then, of course, we'll practice it faster each day. It's a good idea to practice with a metronome because it helps keep your time together. So if you uh, 
happen to have a metronome, start with a slow tempo and always increase. It's very important that in all of these exercises that you learn to play them well and accurately at a slower tempo and then speed up. And pretty soon we want to play them. I can't even play it. <laughs> and so on. Another good exercise for the left hand technique, and of course shake your hands out in between if they get tired, uh, is to start with the A flat note on the G string, and this is another combination of fingers exercises that stays on the same string. As you can see, it starts and goes up the neck. So we'll take a closer look at the combination of fingers. And of course, with this exercise, as all of them, we want to start out slowly and then speed it up. Now let's take a look at an arpeggio study. This one is, um, we'll do a diminished arpeggio. And all an arpeggio is is a chord, it's a single note of a chord. So if you had the C major chord, you would just do the, C, the single notes of the chords, which are. So in this example, we'll start on the C and do the C diminished arpeggio going down. And it sounds like this. And so on. So we'll take a closer look at this exercise because I'd like you to learn how to play this evenly and get through all of the notes. So let's take a look at this one. Okay, so you'll find that this is a fun exercise to play and it's great to work up to speed. And it's always fun to uh, practice with another bass player, for instance. And uh, we used to get together and just play fun things like Popeye, for instance. And what we would do is one of us would play it at a, at a tempo and the other would try to play it faster and then faster and then faster and see who could play it the fastest. But it's like this. <laughs> Okay, and then the other one would go. And like that, so he couldn't get through it, but then the next one would go. And like that, and pretty soon you couldn't hear it anymore. But it's always fun to do, and all of these exercises should be fun for you to play. And we hope that you would practice every day for at least an hour and enjoy playing the bass.
double stops are very effective and useful in uh, many types of music. One of the masters of, uh, that I used to listen to of the, of the double stops uh, is Chuck Rainey, who you can hear his work on all the Steely Dan records and Quincy Jones' old record, Aretha Franklin. The list is endless, but he used to have so many great double stops with, with, with taking advantage of playing chords or more than one note at a time on the bass. Now this is um, something you want to use um, your discretion with because uh, there are keyboard players playing the chords and guitar players are playing the chords and you don't want to get in the way and it can be muddy, especially when you play down in the lower registers. So you want to try to avoid playing chords down low, but of course, up high, it sounds good and it's effectively adding to the music. And uh, many times in a ballad, you'll uh, want to use double stops, they come in handy. And uh, the common intervals that are usually used um, on the bass, I find, are the third or the the tenth. Now all the tenth is is a third an octave higher. For instance, if you have the C scale, which is then you have the tenth of that scale. Well the third is and the tenth, which would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is the root, which is the one, and this is the tenth. So we make use of a lot of tenths, major and minor, on the bass. So you will often hear those. I usually use it on the open string. So for instance, E and then A on the open D string and on the G string. And it's like a cycle of fourths. Okay, very interesting. Anyway, you get to see what, what it's like to take advantage of the notes that are available when you're playing an open string. Now, those are the thirds, for instance, if you're in the key of A, and you have the tenth, the major tenth. We'd also like to take a look at the seventh, which would be, that's the minor seventh, and this is the major seventh. So you have the seventh and the third, and this comes in handy in uh, various styles. Uh, for instance, in a Brazilian style of playing, you would have. Wasn't that special? Thirds and sevenths. We love those thirds and sevenths. Here's another groove that has thirds and sevenths only in a little different vein. One, two, three, four. Okay, so now we'd like to talk about different applications. Now we're a bass player, we're a guitar player, we're playing chords, we're playing different styles. So now I just would like to show you a little thing where we combine three elements. Playing the bass line, playing the chords, and then doing a little soloing on top. And it would go something like this.
So you can see how much fun playing bass can be. And um, that took either six hands or three people to do. So what you may want to do is get together with a couple of your friends and uh, try some trio playing. It's really uh, a good way to bounce ideas off of each other. Okay, on this lesson, we'd like to speak about playing with the drums or playing with the rhythm section. Now, in rhythm section playing, the drummer is your best friend. And it's very important that you listen to two primary things, his kick drum and his snare drum. And uh, a lot of different drummers put the kick and snare in uh, different places in relationship to each other. And sometimes it takes a little bit of getting used to playing to a certain drummer, uh, one as opposed to another. I've uh, had experience playing with uh, some of my favorite drummers, uh, Phil Collins, for instance, who has a very interesting placement of all his grooves, uh, Jeff Picaro, John Robinson, some of my favorite drummers who are almost like metronomes, but each one has a different place where they put the beat. And uh, it's very important that we listen at all times to the drums. Uh, I had a chance to spend some time with Cannonball Adderley before he passed, and one of the things he uh, said before he died was that one of the most important things we can do as musicians is listen. And uh, with that, what we want to do is listen to the drums and just see what the pattern the drums are playing. Now, this is a normal R&B pop kind of pattern. And you notice what the kick drum is doing, and you notice what the snare is doing. So the obvious thing to do would be to match the kick drum, which would be... That would be the first obvious thing that you could do. Now, I'm trying to get more creative. We could do something like change... Change notes. Now, note values have a lot to do with it as well. The short note, for instance. Now, that's playing exactly what the kick drum is doing. But you can think to play in between the kick drum. For instance, if you wanted to play. Now that's one approach. Another approach is to play a more guitaristic kind of part that would sound like this.
So as you can see, there are many different ways of approaching um, the same kind of beat. And also, I was playing with my fingers as opposed to popping. Now, uh, uh, many of us have great popping technique, and uh, I find that some bass players tend to um, maybe overuse the popping thing just a little bit, so you might want to be careful not to walk around with your thumb stretched out, although there's some great grooves with that. Uh, actually, in the beginning, when Larry Graham uh, was around, he did it out of necessity because he was playing with his mother and there was no drummer, so he had to learn how to slap. But um, fortunately, now we have drum grooves and it helps us in our slapping techniques. Slapping with the thumb, pulling on the G string with the four fingers, a little hammering on the left hand, groove and E bass player's best friend. Slapping and pulling and hammering. Sliding A little faster. A little faster. Okay, so that's another way to approach a groove. And of course, there are many different kind of grooves. You have your uh, shuffles, your swings, your ballads, and uh, it's very important that you learn to play all the different kind of grooves. Uh, we're gonna take a look at uh, another groove and we're gonna invite you to participate in this one. Uh, we'll do a little soloing and uh, play the changes. You'll listen to it and then we'll have you participate and I'll give you your cue. And now uh, let's take a look at the shuffle groove. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can play this one as well. Again, we're listening to the kick drum. Kick and snare. Regular blues changes. We just add a little more. Now we're going to walk. Now we're going to accompany the guitar solo.
type groove. Lionel Richie. Here's your basic up-tempo rock groove. On this groove, we'll just have two changes to play over, A minor and D7. There's millions of things you can play over these, and this is just but one of them. Okay, one of the first things you want to make sure is that your bass is in tune. So let's talk about different ways of tuning the bass. I have a five string bass, so my lowest note is a low B and not a low E. Uh, still tuned in fourths, starting with G on the top, D, A, E, and low B. Now there are a few different ways to tune using your ear, which are valuable, 
And one is to play harmonics. Uh, that is, lightly rest your finger over, for instance, the seventh fret on the G string, and that gives you the D. Now, at the same time, lightly rest your finger over the fifth fret on the D string, which gives you the same note. Now, if these two strings are in tune, you won't hear any beats. And you go across the bass and do that on each string. So since we don't hear any beats, it sounds to be in tune. I'll show you what it would sound like if it were out of tune. And you listen for the beats. So you would simply tune it until you don't hear any more beats. Now since the bass is so low, the harmonics help because they are an octave higher. And it's also easy to play out of tune because uh, the, a lot of the notes are very low and sometimes it's hard to hear over the rest of the band. So very important. Another way of using your ear to tune is to use the interval the fifth. And if that sounds in tune, it's a good indication. The fifth is a good indication to see if your bass is in tune. Now, if all those methods fail, for instance, you're in the studio or uh, everyone is playing, it's actually a very good idea to uh, pick up a, an electronic strobe tuner. Now, we have one here, and this is a Yamaha, and many companies make them, but what this allows you to do is tune without having to hear the bass. You can just tune visually. This is a chromatic tuner, and you don't have to adjust anything. So we take a look at it, and we see that we hit the note, and we wait till it is centered over the blinking dot. And it varies from tuner to tuner, and sometimes it wavers a little bit. But as long as it's just over the center, the bass is in tune. So you tune each note with the open string. And it's a good idea in the studio to have your tuner, for instance, coming out of the output of your amplifier or out of the output of your direct box so that it stays in line and you can glance over at it from time to time and make sure your notes are in tune. And another good thing to do is to Say, for instance, play one note and make sure that one note is in tune across the bass. For instance, we'll play the E on the, G, on the G string, E on the D string, E on the A string, and the low E on the E string, E on the B string. And that just allows you to check with your ears to see if the notes are in tune. Now, all of that is fine, but the bass must be intonated. And by intonated, we mean that the string length is long enough or short enough so that when you play the harmonic at the 12th fret and the actual note at the 12th fret, they're both equally in tune with each other. And one of the tricks that we usually use uh, usually, if you have to take your bass into the shop and get it intonated, um, one of the tricks that we usually use to intonate it is just rest it on your lap and get a Phillips screwdriver or whatever the screwdriver you need for your bridge would be. Go down here to the bridge and lengthen or shorten the string yourself. So for instance, you can see the bridge moving. And that way makes it longer or shorter. So a trick to intonating your bass now is we would take a look at the tuner. We would tune the note to G. Get the G centered on the tuner. Then we'd play the harmonic. Make sure that was centered. 
then we'd hit the note. Now if I notice that the tuner is a little bit off, for instance, sharp, that means I have to lengthen the string to make it flatter again. So we go down to the bridge and make the string longer. Now one trick that I usually use in determining whether I should make the string longer or shorter is I look at the tuner and if the notes move to the right of the center position, that means I have to move the bridge to the right or make it longer. And if the notes on the tuner move to the left of the center position, that means I move the bridge to the, to the left. Seems confusing at first, but you'll get the hang of it. Now we look at our tuner, we hit the note, we hit the harmonic, and we hit the actual note. And the two sound in tune with each other. Now your bass is intonated and all the notes will be in tune throughout the neck. Nathan, the first thing I want to ask you is, um, how long have you been playing bass? I've been playing now for about 18 years. 18 years, mm -hmm. yeah. What influenced you the most? Why'd you, why play bass? Well, at the time I looked and it only had four strings on it, so uh, that okay. seemed easier than guitar. So, uh, <laughs> well, you got me fooled, there's five on the one you're playing. There's how five, five at the moment. Bass? Well, uh, I think it's evolved to five at the uh, in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Give you that extra and edge and get that. You have a low B below the Low B, B yes. Yeah. So uh, instead of tuning down all the time, uh, I can play with, um, with the same type of tuning and mm -hmm. have the low B. Now, do you play upright bass too? I do play upright bass as well. I studied that in college and uh, high school and oh. uh, played in symphony orchestras. Oh, so you do a lot of Boeing technique and that yes, too? Yes, I have. Not lately though. No? <laughs> well. How did you get into actually playing electric bass? Did you play in bands, or, or what, what started all off? I think the first electric bass I ever picked up was in uh, church. Oh. And uh, my brothers and I used to have a group that played for folk masses in the Catholic Church oh. in San Diego. And uh, they played guitar, and I was kind of tagging along. And I saw bass there and, and picked it up and fell in love with it immediately. Wow, that's great. How did you, did you get into top 40 bands after that, or commercial bands? Yeah, or? from there I went on to um, play in school bands, and uh, the stage band, jazz ensemble, mm -hmm. and then the garage bands. Well, speaking of jazz ensemble, did you get into reading music? Uh, I did. You mentioned the upright bass. and. Yes, actually my first instrument was cello, so we uh -huh. had to learn how to read. That was in junior high school, and when I got to high school, uh, I discovered the bass, and and I uh, had to learn how to read for the uh, jazz band and the different uh -huh. academic groups that I was in. Yeah, so I guess that's helped you a lot in studio work where you can apply that reading. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it's a must for uh, any kind of studio work where you're not in a band and don't already know the song before you go in. Mm -hmm. Instead of just playing grooves and things <laughs> that you already know. Right. In fact, speaking of that, when you got into playing bands, I mean, what were the most memorable bass lines and the most uh, influential people in your life as far as bass players were concerned? Well, when I started, uh, the first, one of the first bass lines I learned was... Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and Cream was out, and, yeah. and the, the ironic thing is that uh, 18 years later, I'm playing it with Eric Clapton. Yeah, that's <laughs> again, right. You, know, yeah. and, uh, you guys are going on tour again, too, huh? Yes, we've been uh, touring around the world, and uh, we're on our way over to uh, the Royal Albert Hall in London to play this uh, in about a week or so. Wow, that's great. That's terrific. So uh, I think back then, uh, a lot of groups where I, I was very uh, influenced by... Uh, James Brown, some yeah. of his bass lines. Top of the Stack was one of the first ones. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, and uh, a lot of the Motown grooves. Uh, what kind of things, yeah. <laughs> you 
know, those kind of things. Yeah. And I used to say, well, what is that playing that? You know, and uh -huh. the, the bass line was always very memorable. You know, and the list goes on and on. So. Yeah. What about like funk and things like that? Is there anything they're real? I listen to, uh, well, there are a lot of uh, funk groups out, Cool in the Gang, Earth, yeah. Wind and Fire was yeah. one of my favorites, Verdine White, one of my Tower favorite Power, Tower yeah. Power, um, their bass line. <laughs> you know, and yeah. uh, uh, Herbie Hancock had, uh, Paul Jackson was playing bass with him, yeah. and he used to do the... <laughs> You know, he had the, he was one of the first founders of the trills. Yeah. I know you mentioned earlier in some of the lessons about Chuck Rainey, too. Is there anything oh, yeah. that sticks out about Chuck? Chuck Rainey, everything he did was... You know, he used to uh, play great things on all the Steely Dan records, Aretha Franklin. Yeah. all the double stops and yeah he was the king of those kind of licks I, I remember one of the first bass lines i ever learned was a song called reverend lee by roberta flack oh he was yeah, playing bass yeah. On it. hope he's not watching yeah Is there any contemporary bass players now? What about Larry Graham? In, in Larry this? Graham, the inventor of all the popping, he did hair, and uh, he had Graham Central Station, and that was the first time um, all the guys in my band were coming back from, from Oakland saying, there's a guy up here that's unbelievable. He makes the bass growl, and he did uh -huh. the slapping and popping. Uh -huh. And uh, So it, you incorporate a lot of that, and you're playing with them? And yeah, a lot of, you know, just whatever. Everybody has a... a a lick that they do well. Uh -huh. and, you know, whatever. And uh, he was uh, he was a big influence on bass players. Uh -huh. Very big influence. Uh, Paul McCartney was a big influence. Yeah. on and on and I think uh, just in the beginning uh, bass lines seem to be a big part of uh, of a lot of records I mean they still yeah. are if you can you can identify a record by the bass line for instance name that tune <laughs> exactly yeah yeah one of my favorite lines stand by me yeah it's hey. like a well, I think the bass line contributes and gives that hook to the song, like you said. Yeah. Well, so you obviously have a lot of band experience. You've learned a lot of tunes. You played. Where did you take it from there? How did you actually get into the studios in Los Angeles? A lot of people call and ask me, uh, how do you break into the studio? Mm -hmm. There's two ways. Okay. One is with a crowbar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you break. Scaboose. <laughs> <laughs> and one is through a lot of hard work, practice, and uh, connections. Uh -huh. uh, one of the first things I did was, um, because I was very intrigued by studio, you know, and uh, perfect kind of setting and having your instrument recorded in under perfect conditions. Uh -huh. And uh, what you do is uh, find someone in your town or uh, who's doing a lot of studio work mm -hmm. and kind of get under their wing and say, So hey. like a sponsor then. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I did just that mm -hmm. with uh, one of my friends in San Diego where I was raised. Yeah. And uh, just call up and said, Listen, um, I play bass, and I'm kind of interested in uh, breaking into this studio situation. Mm -hmm. And so you go and watch a couple times, see how they do it. It's a pretty uh, valuable experience. You've got a pretty extensive rig, too, as far as your equipment and your rack and everything, huh? Yes, i uh actually been working on a sound and, and uh, rig for a long time, ever since playing the club days, and uh, always trying to improve the quality of pickups and uh, amplification. Mm -hmm. and, and now, um, 
fortunate enough to be uh, endorsed uh, Yamaha equipment. I noticed this base right here. Tell us a little bit about this. It's got your name on it, and it's got well, looks this, like a real. This it's got is a, a great sound. A base. Thank you. This is a base that they made especially for me and uh, uh, from Japan, and it's you know a special five-string active base with a. Oh. Um, I think a very comfortable string spacing, uh -huh. very nice sound, and they, they provide me with all of my strings, basses, wow. uh, amplification, and uh, tuners, just about anything yeah, that I need. Yeah, anything in the world, yeah. So uh, it, really, it really helps to um, you know, belong to a company that is so powerful. Well, they've got such a big reputation. Their instruments are so high quality. I mean, they, they can are. take a lot of abuse, especially throwing them in anvil cases <laughs> and shipping them all over the world right. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm very happy with the Yamaha basses. Hmm. Well, besides that, when you got, as far as auditioning, because you played with a lot of stars, too, how did you end up at that point where you were going on the road with big stars? And, and <clears throat> what were some of the auditions like? And uh, what would you recommend to players that are trying to get out there? Well, I would say it's a, it's a kind of long snowball effect. You, mm -hmm. you see, you look up and see somebody and you say, wow, I want to be there, and, and you aspire to be that, but you don't know how long that person has actually been out there trying to make it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, I can remember um, several auditions, some that I didn't make and some that I made. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's heartbreaking when you don't make the audition, and sometimes you feel like hanging it up, but... Uh, Interestingly enough, some of the groups that I auditioned for um, before I started working in, in the Los Angeles area and failed <laughs> miserably uh -huh. at the audition uh -huh. turned out to uh, be good friends with them and make records with them later on. Yeah. I don't think my playing really changed any, but uh, the things you have to know about an audition is that um, the circumstances usually are kind of tricky, but mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that's the only way to go about it. What would you say the difference is working with different types of leaders? Like, say, if you're on the road with Eric Clapton opposed to working with Quincy Jones? or uh... Well, I would say uh, most of the, the more successful people that I've worked with have been really great guys to work with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, for instance, working with um, Al Jarreau, mm -hmm. um, I would play certain things that weren't on the record, and he was really, he really loved that. You know? Yeah, And yeah. he liked something different, whereas other artists, they wanted exactly like the record. Mm -hmm. uh, Quincy Jones is one of the nicest producers, men in the business, and you go in the studio with him, he immediately makes you feel at home. And uh -huh. uh, Eric Clapton is like a brother to me. We, we have great times oh, that's great. Uh, on the road together. And uh, again, there's a very uh, mutual respect. Um, mm -hmm. Um, both of our parts, and it just makes it makes the gigs really fun. Wow, wow! Sounds like a great deal of experience. What is getting down to the specifics? What do you actually practice uh, in the early stages of your playing? Did you have certain? Uh, we discussed earlier in the lessons about technique. Certain things. Were there a certain number of hours of day you practiced, or did you work with records, or what did you do? Well, yeah, I would say that there was an interest there, so it, it went from in the in the beginning to um, holding a broomstick on in front of the TV hey, with the Beatles playing hey. to um, actually playing to my favorite records and uh, if I didn't have the record I would play to the radio mm -hmm. and just sit there and whatever they were playing um, I would try to learn that and uh, I would go out and buy my favorite records back it up put the needle back yeah. scratch yeah. it yeah. put it back scratch it but then I'd do it even at a slower speed yeah. so that I could learn what they were playing and uh -huh. uh, of course, had to learn a lot of tunes for top 40 bands. Yeah. Well, it seems like, what about your like daily practice routine as far as you had certain technical exercises of practicing with a metronome, or did you do some sight reading too, or how did you prepare yourself? Well, I was fortunate enough to be in, uh, involved in a lot of school bands, oh. a stage band, and um, actually even marching band, and things that forced me to play and read every day. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a built-in kind of practice schedule because there was music that I had to take home and learn. And then at the same time, uh, involved in uh, high school bands, garage bands, playing Santana songs and uh, Top 40. So uh, it was a combination of reading during the day and then going home and uh, practicing with the radio and records. Well, where do you see yourself a year from now? What's the future hold for Nathan East? Well, I think since I built a studio at home, uh, there's going to be a lot more production that I'm going to get involved with, mm -hmm. and eventually um, um, artist 
um, with my brother Marcel, he, who's a talented producer, guitar yeah. player, writer. Yeah, and great drum programmer, too. <laughs> <And> drum programmer, <laughs> which is He's important awesome. nowadays. Yeah, I know. Programmed all the drums for uh, the solo for the solo videos. <laughs> and both of you are pilots, too, We're so both you can pilots. fly to the gig, too, huh? <laughs> so yeah. uh, I think we could look for a record from... Uh, East meets East, or whatever we're going to yeah, call it. Or Flying High. Or, or Flying High. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Nathan.